The evolution of the iconic Run and Gun series Contra has proven to be quite the emotional roller coaster ride since its explosive debut in arcades in 1987 and undergoing all sorts of wild iterations and mutations leading all the way up to a brand new game in 2024. On a mission to delve beyond the more well-known and beloved entries of the franchise, I recently took on the challenge of completing every main game in the series and also exploring the numerous home computer and mobile versions. So in this two-part retrospective, we'll blast our way through over 30 Contra games and ports, with this first installment revisiting everything from the quarter-munching arcade original and up through the 16-bit masterworks on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Let's review aggressively and check out every Contra game. It all started in the arcades with Konami's release of Contra in 1987 in Japan, North America, and Europe, with the European version being renamed to Grizor in an attempt to disassociate the game with political events such as the Iran-Contra scandal occurring around the same time period. Settling nicely somewhere between Konami's previous hit action titles like Russian Attack and Gradius, players would get a now textbook example of the run and gun genre mixing platforming with a heavy focus on shooting down hordes of enemies and dodging a hellscape of bullets, with special features including two-player simultaneous play, a vertically oriented screen, and occasional moments of pseudo 3D perspectives to mix up the gameplay. Despite the Contra title and its main characters being seemingly inspired by Nicaraguan revolutionaries, the game's thematic elements borrow much more heavily from the action blockbuster film Aliens, which had been released a year prior. Set in the distant future of 2633, the fate of the Earth is up to the two commandos Bill Riser and Lance Bean as they head to the island of Galuga to destroy the base of the Red Falcon organization and the alien entity controlling them. Legally distinct aliens, of course. The H.R. Giger design inspirations are fairly blatant at times, and even the characters' names are amalgamations of actors from Aliens. Regardless of originality, it makes for a great setting to frame the adrenaline-pumping gameplay presented here. At its core basics, you control the game with an 8-way joystick and two buttons dedicated to shooting and the iconic somersault jumping. You're able to aim and shoot in multiple directions, even while in the air, and can also lie prone on the ground for additional evasive maneuvers. And you'll definitely need to learn how to avoid getting hit, as you'll die instantly from any contact with an enemy or their projectiles, setting the standard for a high level of difficulty that the franchise would become notorious for. On the weaponry side of things, you start with a basic gun that can be upgraded with pickups into either a machine gun, laser, spread shot, or fireball, along with rapid fire upgrades or temporary invincibility items. And sadly, any collected weapons will be lost when you die. The first stage is a side-scroller set up in a typical run-and-gun format, but after you bust through the defensive wall at the end of the level, the game switches up the perspective into the third dimension with a view behind the player, shooting your way up through various hallways of the enemy base, destroying generators to progress through corridors while a ticking countdown timer keeps you blasting briskly through every room. You do lose the ability to aim here and can only shoot straight forward, but can still jump and go prone on the ground for dodging bullets or blowing up things at different heights. Eventually you'll face off with a boss in the standard perspective again and then make your way to the waterfall stage. This level finally makes a good use case of the vertical screen orientation as you climb upwards instead of traversing to the right, a gameplay mechanic that would eventually gain some infamy as you could easily kill the other player playing with you if they can't keep up the pace and fall off the bottom of the screen. After making your way up top and through another well-defended fortification, you go through another set of 3D hallways similar to the second stage, but with the difficulty ramping up, of course. Now, the final stage goes back to a side-scrolling view, but also presents a seamless journey through multiple environments and bosses, traveling through snowfields, the energy zone, the spike-laden hangar, and ultimately the alien's lair, seeing you dramatically blast your way through a giant grotesque alien mouth, traversing through its guts, and finally destroying its pulsating heart. Being someone more familiar with the segmented stages of the NES version, and then finally playing this one, 
I was definitely taken aback by how well the stages blurred together and provided a thrilling ride of non-stop excitement to its finish. And finishing this one is no cakewalk. While I went for a one credit clear in my own challenge I'm undertaking, it's worth noting that the game doesn't allow you to keep feeding quarters into it in order to brute force your way to the end, and has a limit of three continues before requiring you to start over from the beginning. This might feel pretty mean at first, but it's a fairly short game once you start to learn and memorize everything, and in general the game feels quite fair, on normal difficulty anyway. The control is very responsive and consistent, and while your character doesn't move super quickly, everything around you is appropriately designed to accommodate for it. And if you can manage to hang on to the supremely powerful spread shot, you'll surely be able to overpower those Red Falcon hordes with maniacal glee. And while this original version might look and feel a little weird to most folks that may be used to the NES game, fans of the series should really give this one a shot and see where it all began. In case you're wondering on which region's version to check out, gameplay-wise they're all virtually identical, with the exception of the European Gryzor having two-player alternating play instead of two-player simultaneous play. But overall, Contra was very well received and rather successful in arcades, and would quickly start to spawn all sorts of home conversions, which we'll dig into now. And here's the one many of you are probably waiting for. Ah, didn't think you could get off easy and dip right into the beloved NES version, did you? Oh no, first off, we'll be diving into some of the ports released on home computer platforms, first looking at a trio of conversions licensed by Konami but developed by Ocean Software. The Amstrad CPC, a fairly successful line of home computers in Europe in the 80s, would be the first to receive a port of Gryzor, as it was initially titled in the region, and was honestly an admirable attempt at bringing the experience home with pretty severe technical limitations. The sprite work here is actually pretty juicy and colorful looking, although you'll notice that you have individual static screens to run through as opposed to continuous scrolling. There are also some limitations in the sound department, as you have to choose between either music or sound effects during play of the 128K version, as you can't have both at the same time, and the 64K version has sound effects only. Two-player simultaneous mode is also not available, and you'll need to take turns. Controlling the game is where things get strange. Up is jump, down is used to drop down to lower ledges, but you can still aim in various directions and go prone as long as you are shooting. It's a little awkward if you're used to the typical controls, and it makes the game pretty challenging. Otherwise, this port makes clear efforts to include as much game content as they could from the original, with a few stages restructured a bit, but no snowfield or armored trooper miniboss. And the fireball gun also didn't make the cut. I gotta mention the pretty hilarious ending though. Once you blow up Emperor Demon Evil Heart Gamera Moss King, you get this lovely screen letting you know that despite your efforts, the earth blows up anyway. How sad. And finally, another very notable thing to bring up regarding this version is the origination of Bob Wakelin's now iconic artwork that was created for this and the other ocean ports taking clear inspiration from not only Aliens, but also the recently released Predator film, borrowing two poses of Arnold for Bill and Lance here, and Lance would get a little Rambo injection with the haircut and headband. Gryzor would also make its way onto another popular European computer, the ZX Spectrum, facing even more technical limitations this time around. Obviously, the color palette is very limited here, but this version does have actual screen scrolling, along with the benefit of simultaneous sound and music. Control-wise, the main funkiness here is probably the inability to move left on some of the side-scrolling stages, despite being able to on the 3D bases and waterfall stage. Guns also behave a little differently. The machine gun, fireball, or spread shot are obtained by simply shooting the containers for them in the first stage, and you're actually stuck with that weapon for the rest of the game, even if you die. And there's no laser and no barrier power-up. Which is a bummer, because this one is rather challenging, further compounded by bullets being pretty difficult to see sometimes. But much like the Amstrad version, it does make a valiant effort to include as much content as possible from the arcade original. It 
And in perhaps the most bewildering version here, we've got the Commodore 64 port, released both in Europe and North America in 1988. The art looks a bit low effort, and unlike any of the other versions so far, while everything moves along pretty smoothly, the speed of the game doesn't line up well with the abysmally slow rate of gunfire that you can output. To make the difficulty exponentially worse are the controls, as you must use a joystick for moving and shooting, but have to jump using the keyboard spacebar. And while you could potentially remap this sort of thing if you're using an emulator, I attempted the authentic control scheme and eventually ended up putting my keyboard on the floor so that I could use my foot to stomp on the spacebar. It was a fun novelty for a few minutes, but ultimately a frustrating gaming experience. On the content side of things, the fireball gun is missing, but this does manage to include every level and boss from the arcade version, so at least that's something positive. It's too bad we never ended up getting an Amiga port of Contra, which was in development for some time, and even had some screenshots shown on the back of the box for the Commodore 64 and DOS versions, and was also mentioned in various magazines, but was ultimately cancelled. And speaking of the DOS version, here we go with likely the most unfortunate abomination of the bunch. This time brought to us by Banana Development. And yeah, let's just bask in this CGA glory right here. At least the screen scrolls, kinda, but obviously it's extremely choppy. And this conversion was apparently designed specifically for a processor running at 4.77 MHz and ended up playing way too fast on anything else. If you try this out on DOSBox, you'll want to drop the cycles down to make this somewhat playable. And the problems run deeper with the control scheme, utilizing the numpad to move around but requiring the center key to be pressed in order to actually stop running. And as the game lags out, your inputs will also suffer the consequences. This can be alleviated somewhat with a gamepad or joystick, but the game is still pretty brutal to try and get through. And audio is limited to PC speaker bleeps and buzzes, a fitting soundtrack for melting your eyeballs with these graphics. Now CGA can look okay in some instances, but I'm not convinced that this is one of them. Some positives though, two player simultaneous mode is a thing. And the game is also fairly faithful, with including all of the levels in some form, and along with the bosses. But otherwise, consider this one simply a morbid curiosity. And the version perhaps most familiar to everyone, it's finally time to look at the Famicom and NES port, released in Japan and North America in 1988, and also eventually for PAL regions in 1990 under the name Probotector. Now rather than crank out a scaled down version of the arcade experience, Konami would give Contra a complete overhaul by ditching the vertical screen aspect ratio, providing tighter controls, improving the sound quality and music, and lengthening the stages with all new structures, the end result was a smash hit for the console that quickly became one of the most successful action games of the era and still very fondly remembered today. I can still remember my dad buying this game for me one random afternoon while at a local drugstore that usually had an assortment of NES games for sale, and I didn't really know what I was in for at the time, but it wasn't long before it became one of my favorite games despite its punishing challenge. I mean, gotta give a shout out to the Konami code for the 30 lives needed to actually make some progress and eventually beat the game, and little did I know that someday I could get through this without power-ups and without dying. But getting back into some of the differences from the arcade original, the first and probably best upgrade is the responsive control, which feels much snappier and more precise, and ultimately making the game feel very fair, despite the constant onslaught of enemies and bullets coming at you. The weapon power-ups are all intact, Although here we would get the classic falcon symbols for every drop. All of the levels from the arcade version are also here, but with some modifications. The base levels no longer have a timer or required hallway turns, and some of the bosses are slightly altered like this super rad looking new boss of the waterfall stage, and the latter half of the game has been split up into extended stages of each of the unique areas, the snowfield, energy zone, hangar, and alien lair. While the seamless level transitions of the arcade version are missed a bit here, 
This compromise does at least add more content and length to the game. Aesthetically, Contra is translated to the 8-bit console extremely well, with vibrant colors and detailed pixel art, and those Giger-inspired monster designs still looking fantastic. The game also performs extremely well with minimal lag and sprite flickering that rarely affects the gameplay. Music and sound effects are also top-notch, bringing us some of the most memorable music on the NES and cementing Konami's prowess in quality sound design for the time period. The Japanese version would also have a leg up in the graphics department, as Konami was able to utilize a special chip for the Famicom cartridge, allowing for animated backgrounds, animated cutscenes, and also a level map screen in between stages. While these extras may make the Famicom version the definitive one to play here, luckily the other versions still essentially play the same, but with some minor tweaks. Weirdly, the game's plot was modified slightly for the North American version, placing it in the Amazon jungle in present-day 1987, and changing the code names to Mad Dog and Scorpion for our blue pants and red pants dudes. The PAL version would see a more drastic facelift with being renamed Probotector, replacing the playable characters and most of the enemies with robots instead of humans. Otherwise, the gameplay is nearly identical to the North American version. The sprite swaps were made to work around laws in Germany at the time regarding violence in video games. It's also worth mentioning the North American and PAL versions start off with slightly reduced difficulty, and starting the second loop of the game is the same level of challenge that the Famicom kicks off with. But from there, you can continue to scale up the difficulty with each consecutive cleared loop of the game if you're up for it. And while the game's reputation of NES hard can be a bit divisive for some, for me, it's one of my favorite elements of this game, and keeps me playing it repeatedly over the years. First-time players will surely struggle a bit, but it does keep things fairly reasonable by not making you restart after losing a life, granting three continues, and of course allowing for the legendary Konami code, giving you 30 lives per player. So once you start memorizing all the stage hazards and enemy behaviors, you'll be well on your way to blowing the face off of Red Falcon, getting up in those alien guts, and exploding the pulsating heart within. A truly satisfying conclusion to an 8-bit masterpiece where you can consider yourself a hero. And one more Contra port to cover here is a pretty unique version for the Japanese home computer MSX2, released in 1989 and developed and published by Konami. It seems to bear a bit more similarity to the NES version compared to the arcade, but features all new levels and artwork, and a switch back to the single screen setup we saw before in the old Amstrad port. Despite that limitation, the game feel is pretty solid, although undoubtedly a far less challenging experience, especially considering the addition of a life bar and a generous amount of lives that can be acquired during the playthrough. Getting through this port also might take you a bit longer than other versions, clocking in at a total of 19 levels, albeit a few of them are more like short boss fights, and some stages are often feeling rather recycled. Power-ups are also handled a little differently, with weapon pickups triggering a menu to select your gun from, along with falcon items that incrementally upgrade your movement speed and bullet strength. All in all, it's a pretty neat alternative version of this game that's definitely worth a look if you're a curious Contra fan, but ultimately may be a bit repetitive and disappointing in the challenge department. And finally, the clear paramount at the top of this Contra heap is the LCD handheld from 1989. I kid, but honestly, this is kind of fun for what it is. Multiple angled lanes of alien blasting and bullet dodging await in one of Konami's forays into liquid crystal display games. And it is at least notable for being the first portable version of Contra, even predating the first Game Boy title. And it's a pretty cool looking collector's piece. Beyond that, excluding the copious amounts of straight re-releases and compilation appearances of the arcade and NES versions, the only other unique iterations of Contra we haven't covered yet would be some of the mobile ports for cell phones released many years later, 
which I will save for part two in this video series. I'm sure you can't wait. But it's finally time to move on to the first sequel, Super Contra. What is this place? Keep your eyes peeled. So Contra would get its first sequel in early 1988 with the arcade release of Super Contra. Bill and Lance would return in another run-and-gun adventure one year after the events of the first game, again facing off with Red Falcon, who has commandeered a military installation. At first glance, it doesn't feel too far removed from the original Contra and retains the same vertical screen setup, but there are a few considerable changes the further you delve in. On the control side, the main thing to point out right away is the addition of a high jump executed by holding up while jumping, a maneuver often unknown to new players, but absolutely essential to survival. Your weaponry also has evolved a bit, with four different guns, including the spread shot, rapid fire missiles, a laser, and grenade launcher, some of which are upgradable to a second and more powerful version. The Falcon logos are not present here though, so you'll need to remember what your favorite or least favorite gun looks like. The side-scrolling sections will feel pretty familiar, but with some fancy inclined planes added in. And interestingly, you won't find a single death pit to fall into, putting a stronger focus on running and gunning over platforming. The general intensity has been ramped up, with a lot more enemies running around and more projectiles to avoid, and multiple memorable boss battle set pieces. The second stage introduces a top-down perspective. No more pseudo 3D stuff this time around. There's not much innovation happening here compared to other top-down shooters of the time, but you do at least get a new power-up here with a screen-wiping bomb that you can collect and use when desired. The game has five levels total with themes you can expect at this point. Military outposts, a jungle full of deadly foreground layers blocking your view, and of course some pulsating alien guts corridors. The look and sound of everything isn't too far off from the original, maybe a bit grittier and washed out looking in parts, but overall I'd say slightly improved in the graphics and sound department. And while it's a shorter experience than the first game, I considered the level of challenge to be exponentially higher this time around, and again your number of continues will be limited to three on the default dip switch settings. Personally, I had to put in a lot more hours in this to get a 1cc compared to the first game. And while this harshness can be off-putting to many, in the end I found it to be a lot more intense and highly satisfying, and absolutely worth a playthrough for any hardcore Contra fans out there. Super Contra would also get a couple of North American exclusive computer ports in 1990, including this DOS conversion developed by a distinctive software and renamed Super C, like the other versions to follow. While some might immediately cringe at the sight of this, it was certainly a step up from the other Contra game for DOS, and a solid effort of capturing the spirit of the arcade game. The level designs and boss fights follow along pretty closely for the most part, and the controls are mostly faithful even down to the high jump and intermediate angles on your bullets, and it supports two-player simultaneous play. The absurd level of challenge also compounds a bit, thanks to extremely fast enemies and a few completely broken moments where you might just die for no reason. To amend for this, you at least start with 10 lives, and you gain 10 more each time you clear a stage. So assuming you're able to hook up a gamepad or joystick here, I'd say you have a fighting chance. The keyboard users, good luck. In the end, I honestly had a fun time beating this one, even if it was kind of on accident with one life left. The same developers under an alternate name Unlimited Software would also release an Amiga version, although oddly it only got a North American release. It generally looks and feels similar to the DOS version, with some slightly better graphics and sound quality. Unfortunately, things go south once you start to battle with the controls. Not unlike the Amstrad CPC port we covered earlier, you are limited to one button for shooting, and jumping is handled by pressing up, 
causing all sorts of complications in aiming and also getting rid of the high jump ability. Intermediate bullet angles are also removed and you are locked into 8-way directional shots. Unfortunately, this really makes the game generally unwieldy and frustrating and damn near impossible to make progress without some serious patience for jank. But once again, Konami would bring us a superbly crafted version of Super C for the Famicom and NES, with a similar approach to its predecessor and how they evolved the source material to create an absolute beast of a game. The feel is essentially identical to Contra 1, ignoring the arcade's high jump and instead sticking with the same controls you're probably used to. The power-up system also retains the various Falcon symbols, with no upgrades per weapon other than the Rapid Fire R. Focus groups must have demanded a better F-gun, so this time around you get a big splashy fireball attack that can also be charged up to unleash even more damage, and finally gives the spread shot a run for its money as being the OP weapon of choice. The spread shot even got nerfed a little bit by inflicting half as much damage to the bosses. Super C is also a bit longer than the arcade version, interspersing the existing level framework with all new unique areas and boss battles, including an expanded alien lair and mutated monstrosity to face off with at the conclusion. The two top-down stages are still there, and platforming is not completely thrown out the window like the arcade original, with plenty of death pits and other hazardous and dramatic looking moments to progress through. Challenge-wise, it still has that firm but fair feeling, although it does seem to be a bit more troll-filled with lots of spawning goons and more random projectiles in the mix. It's certainly feeling more reasonable than the brutality of the arcade version, though. And as far as different regions' releases go, there's nothing too drastic this time around. The Japanese version includes a cheat code for 30 lives and a level select, while the US code only gives you 10 lives. And once again, the PAL version would be sprite swapped with robots and receive the title Protector 2 Return of the Evil Forces. All in all, it's an incredible follow-up. Arguably better than the original in some aspects, but maybe ultimately down to personal preference as to which of the two NES games might be your favorite. Going under the radar for a little bit here, I also wanted to point out a few other alternative means of getting your Contra fix, as there were a healthy handful of bootlegs released to wean off the success of the series. While some pirate carts you might come across were basically straight up copies, a few included totally redesigned stages like Super Contra 2, or sometimes even using a different game engine, like this surprisingly fun jankster piece Super Contra 7, and this fairly ambitious demake of Contra Spirits which honestly wins the award for best ending screen in the series. On the fan-made side, there are also a wide array of ROM hacks that have been made for both the original Contra and Super C, either with small modifications and improvements, translations, or a completely overhauled level design. Revenge of the Red Falcon might be one of the highlights here, bordering on Kaizo levels of difficulty, but still very playable. Or Deadpool fans might want to check out Deadpool Special Mission, released fairly recently at the end of 2023. One last unlicensed oddity is the TRS-80 color computer conversion titled The Contras, based on the first NES title, and apparently only being available for purchase via mail order and having a very limited print run. It retains a fairly authentic look and feel, but with some modifications to levels, enemy behaviors, and controls. It still seems to be pretty buggy in the end. It's cool that this even exists though. I also should mention Konami's YY World games, two light-hearted Famicom exclusives that feature a wide array of characters and references from the company's body of work. YY World 2 even includes Bill as a very kawaii playable character and a recreation of the jungle stage from Contra 1. So other than that glorious LCD handheld we were looking at earlier, the Contra series would get its first portable release in 1991 for the Nintendo Game Boy, simply titled Contra in Japan, 
and renamed to Operation C in North America. European regions would also get their own robotic version named Probotector in 1992. And while it certainly has very recognizable elements and music from previous Contra games, Operation C has all new levels of its own and a few other things to set it apart as its own unique experience that actually succeeds very well on the small screen. You control Scorpion in a battle against Black Viper this time around, in the North American version anyway, and you're on a mission to destroy an alien embryo thing being kept and incubated for nefarious purposes. You've got five levels total, three of them the usual side-scrolling fare, and two top-down stages as well, not unlike what we got in Super C, and of course including a variety of mini-bosses and stage bosses to face off with. In the guns department, you have the standard but actually very effective machine gun, the return of the fireball, and an upgrade-capable spread shot, and also the first appearance of a homing weapon that automatically seeks out the nearest enemy. The wrists of Game Boy users could also get some relief here, with fully automatic rapid fire for all weapons instead of resorting to button mashing. Also on the play control end of things, your movement has been slowed down here to accommodate the smaller screen size, and you might need a bit of an adjustment period to get used to the jumping height and physics. Overall, it's undoubtedly Contra, and it looks, sounds, and plays great, even if it doesn't really bring anything substantially new and innovative to the table after the previous entries in the series. But at this early stage in the handheld gaming era, just being able to play Contra in the backseat of the car on a road trip was innovation enough. And I must say, playing this game on an actual TV screen with a Super Game Boy accessory is definitely a pleasure. And it's a nice bite-sized run-and-gun experience with a more reasonable and casual-friendly difficulty curve as well. Some minor complaints might be a lack of two-player mode, and some harder difficulty modes could have been cool. And of course, more levels and content is always welcomed. But regardless, I still have a blast with this one every time I pick it up. Contra would see one of its most dramatic and explosive evolutions yet in the first 16-bit iteration of the series with Contra 3 The Alien Wars for the Super Nintendo, aka Contra Spirits for the Super Famicom, and Super Probotector Alien Rebels for PAL regions, all released in 1992. The story drops us into the year 2636, where Red Falcon has laid waste to Neo City and the Alien Wars have begun. Bill and Lance return in the Japanese version, but for North America, Konami have seemingly killed off Mad Dog and Scorpion, with their descendants Jimbo and Sully taking over for some reason. The regional differences in plot continue to muddy the waters, but regardless, we are immediately dropped into a hyperkinetic, action-packed, post-apocalyptic environment chock full of dramatic chaos and memorable action, with Nobuya Nakazato at the helm of directing the project, a name we'd see in the credits of many future Contra titles and other Konami classics. He took the series into a more cinematic direction that really pushed the limits of the new hardware. Rather than the typical level structure of previous entries of the series, he aimed for something new and crazy to happen every three screen scrolls, further pushing the wide variety of gameplay experiences and crafting an absolutely wild ride full of over-the-top B-movie style action schlock moments, from battling giant turtle beasts to motorcycle chases to clinging to freaking missiles while blowing up a massive spacecraft. There are six levels total, including two top-down stages that make heavy use of the Mode 7 features of the SNES that allow you to rotate the screen as you navigate a large area to destroy various capsules to progress forward. These sections are generally not as well liked as the usual side view stages, but they break up the action nicely and are quite impressive from a technical standpoint. Aside from the advancements in level design, some new gameplay mechanics would also be introduced. Each player can now carry two different weapon types at a time and switch between them at will, 
even being able to fire them both at once with a rarely useful somersault attack, or by rapidly switching between the two while firing, it allows you to unleash double the amount of projectiles than usual. Automatic rapid fire is also in use for everything, and weaponry includes some returning favorites like the classic machine gun, an improved and powerful laser, a homing shot, and the good old spread shot is back as well, although definitely nerfed on the damage output. The F gun is now a straight up flamethrower that proves extremely useful in specific moments, and the new MVP of the bunch might have to be the Crusher missiles, with a somewhat shorter range but extremely powerful and explosive. To top it off, you can also pick up and stockpile screen wiping bombs to clear things up when it gets too overwhelming. Your maneuvers would also get a nice addition with the ability to lock your stance while aiming, along with being able to cling to many walls and ceiling surfaces. And overall, it's a true pleasure to control, it's super responsive and very smooth. On the options side of things, two-player simultaneous play works great, although the top-down stages can get a little weird with the choice to either share one screen or split the screen, either one making those stages a little more challenging without very deliberate teamwork. We'd also get three difficulty settings, with hard mode being the only way to see the true ending and an exclusive final boss form. You also get to increase your starting lives up to 7 if you want, or the Japanese version also has a 30 live code. One thing's for sure, the Contra level of challenge is in full force here, especially once you ramp things up to hard mode. Top that off with its top-notch new aesthetic, a pulse-pounding soundtrack, and expertly crafted action set pieces, and Konami truly dropped a run-and-gun masterpiece on us with this one, a title still highly regarded to this day as a prime example of the genre, and certainly one of the best games on the Super Nintendo, period. Contra 3 would also get a conversion for the Game Boy in 1994 with Contra The Alien Wars, attempting to fit the experience onto a portable platform. Konami outsourced development to Factor 5 on this one, a studio somewhat well known for its work on the Turrican series, another similar run-and-gun franchise of the era. And they certainly made a commendable effort here to cram as much action-packed content as they could into a tiny package. Some things are obviously missing, of course. You can't have more than one gun, it is single player only, the top down stages cannot be rotated, the motorcycle and missile riding sections are gone, and many bosses are either removed or modified heavily. And it's naturally much slower and clunky than its 16 bit predecessor, giving the gameplay a bit more of a methodical and calculated feel to it. There are plenty of difficulty options and a password feature and even a maniac mode that only gives you two lives to complete the entire game. It also has some Super Game Boy enhancements, with basic color palettes and additional sound effects that utilize the Super Nintendo hardware on occasion. All in all, this is a very solid handheld port that is certainly of interest for Contra fans. And we'll branch out of the release timeline briefly here with a blast forward into 2002 when Contra 3 would get repurposed once more for the Game Boy Advance with Contra Advance The Alien Wars EX, developed by Tosei. And rather than just dump the Super Nintendo ROM onto a cart, the game would end up being reworked considerably into another smaller screened iteration with a handful of somewhat considerable drawbacks. Removed features include the ability to carry two guns, along with the screen clearing bombs. And the Mode 7 Tastic top down levels are also missing and have been swapped out with reworked sections from the Genesis Contra game, Contra Hardcore. And in general, the gameplay area is really compacted, leading to somewhat larger hitboxes on your character, along with larger bullets, and some of the hazards becoming increasingly difficult to avoid. 
Pair that with a lot of slightly modified enemy and boss behaviors, and veterans of the originals might have a tough time reconfiguring their muscle memory to survive the new patterns. It does have two difficulty modes, Novice and Normal, which play similarly other than the number of lives and continues available. And the Novice mode also cuts the content short at a point and encourages increasing the difficulty in order to see the remainder of the game. There's also a password feature, which oddly will give you passwords that don't work sometimes. Fortunately, there's still a two-player link-up feature, although honestly, I would imagine that to get super chaotic with the reduced real estate. One actually helpful addition I should bring up is the ability to lock your aim while you're running, which definitely comes in handy sometimes and helps balance out the increased difficulty from the weird feeling this whole experience gives off. Overall, this version is certainly playable, but in many ways feels like a hamstrung hodgepodge of two extremely good games, as opposed to a unique compilation. Its release also probably disappointed some at the time, with oddly timed marketing around the same time as Shattered Soldier was coming out on the PlayStation 2, making it seem a bit like a handheld port of that game as opposed to recycling the 16-bit classics. Of course, it's still based on extremely good games, so you could do much worse. But the main reason to play Contra Advance these days is if you're very curious to see what differences pop up in the gameplay. Now let's head back to 1992 with one of the weirdest outliers of the bunch here, Contra Force, released exclusively in North America for the NES several months after Contra 3 had already dropped onto the Super Nintendo. Originally developed in 1991 with the working title of Arkhound, the Japanese release of the game was cancelled, but eventually rebranded and repurposed for this game which kind of looks and smells like a Contra, but it veers off into some really different directions, and it's all in slow motion. But let's dig into the content here a little bit before tackling the obvious performance issues plaguing this one. Set in the current time of 1992, a terrorist group named DNME has taken over Neo City and captured its chief commissioner, and it's up to four random dudes from C-Force to save the day. Bill and Lance are nowhere to be found here, nor are any Red Falcon or even aliens for that matter. But instead we've got Burns, Smith, Iron, and Beans, which notably marks the first time in a Contra game you'd be able to pick from multiple characters that each have some different traits and weapon loadouts. You can pause and switch them out at any time, each with their own stock of lives, and you can even call in one of your comrades for help at any time with various AI-driven strategies, and they'll appear in-game to assist you for 5 seconds. As mentioned, each character plays a little differently with different jump heights and weapon loadouts, which can be upgraded Gradius style as you pick up various suitcase drops throughout the stages, often hidden in the copious amounts of destructible walls and objects. There's another weird difference from Contra here in terms of controls, where you can no longer shoot diagonally downwards while running, and instead have to jump a bit awkwardly to get that shot angle. At least your jump height can also be variable depending on how long you hold the button down. Other game features include two-player simultaneous play, five levels including two top-down perspective stages, boss fights that sometimes have extraordinary amounts of health, the aforementioned destructible environments, and an overall experience absolutely drenched in slowdown. Now slowdown in NES games isn't anything new, but here it's another level of sludginess, as even just a single enemy on the screen can start causing performance issues. One has to wonder if this is why the original release of Arkhound was cancelled, and it's honestly a bit baffling that Konami thought it would be fine to slap the Contra brand onto something with such a glaringly obvious problem. It's still somewhat playable if you're very patient, especially through some of the janky platforming sections, but it's a painful flaw that can't be ignored. It's a shame, since this had some pretty cool ideas for its time, topped off with some really solid graphics and a banger soundtrack to boot.
and it really could have been a sleeper hit if the game ran properly and it wasn't burdened with the expectations of the Contra logo on the box. And those going into this expecting an improvement on Super C or something, they'll be sorely disappointed. Sadly, not even a ROM hack seems to be able to fix this game. Although supposedly there may be some slight improvement available if you're willing to tinker around with overclocking emulators. I will mention that very recently in 2024, a fan-made Contra Force remake has been released for PC, appearing to be more of a complete overhaul and reimagining, utilizing assets from several different classic Contra games. Now I haven't tried this one myself, but I might have to check this one out someday. And finally, we have arrived at what is likely the most outrageous franchise entry we'll be covering in this video, Contra Hardcore, released exclusively for the Mega Drive and Sega Genesis in 1994. Taking place five years after the Alien Wars, this dilapidated and crime-infested planet instigates the formation of the Hardcore a squad of four elite soldiers who must quickly take on the task of responding to the compromise of the city's defense system, and the mission continues to escalate from there. You can pick from Ray, Sheena, Fang, or Brownie, each with their own unique playstyle and set of weaponry available. And all characters would also get a super useful new sliding ability. Ray and Sheena play more like what you might have been used to in Contra 3, but Fang brings the attitude with some powerful charge-up shots and straight-up punching attacks. And our little robo-buddy Brownie enjoys the benefits of being short, along with a jetpack and hover ability. And not to mention a completely OP yo-yo thing that wreaks absolute havoc on bosses. The possibilities expand even further as the game introduces branching level design as you progress through stages and make important decisions that lead to a variety of plot pathways and multiple endings in one of the most story-centric experiences yet in the series. But make no mistake, high-octane action is still the top priority here. All of the levels go with the side view, unless you count some very technically impressive 3D-esque background effects. And not unlike Contra 3, the gameplay evolves in a very fast-paced and dynamic fashion. You'll also notice an increase in the amount of boss encounters, giving some sections of the game more of a boss rush feel, and results in a non-stop assault of hyper-creative chaos. Astute running gunners might notice some design similarities to later treasure-developed games, such as Gunstar Heroes and Alien Soldier, which shared some of the same designers. Aesthetically, it still feels very Contra, but it almost takes it to a more cartoony and comic book look, with a nice mix of goofy and grotesque monster designs, all supplemented by an absolutely banging techno-funk-fueled soundtrack that might be one of the best of its kind on the console. Everything is just so over-the-top and insane, and in the best way possible. Admittedly, the challenge level has proven to be over the top for some. While it lacks difficulty options, there are some regional differences if you're looking for different experiences in this regard. The Japanese version might be the most gentle introduction, giving you three health per life and unlimited continues, while the US version sticks to the good old one hit death and five continues. The PAL Probotector release also has one hit death, but drops you to four continues. And there's also a ROM hack floating around that restores the three health for life, but you still get English text for all of the dialogue and cutscenes. And like most Contra titles, the game controls and plays in a tough but fair way once you get in enough practice. Top that off with the character differences, varied level paths, and even a secret ending, there's truly no shortage of replayability here, making this a very addictive game to explore and master, and undoubtedly one of the best and most memorable games in the Contra series. And that wraps it up for part one. In the next video, we'll be digging into the remainder of the franchise, starting with the stumble into an awkward transition to 3D on the PlayStation 1, and then riding that volatile wave of quality all the way to the newest game in the series, 2024's Operation Galuga. I should also mention that many of the games covered today have been re-released in an astounding variety of ways if you're looking to give them a try. 
but probably the most recent and generally well-assembled compilation available might be the Contra Anniversary Collection, which includes seven of the more beloved games and a few extra regional variations, and is available on PC and other modern console platforms. And if you're curious to see some of my 1cc and deathless clears of some of these games, I've been uploading them to a second channel that I'll link in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I'd love to hear some of your favorite Contra memories in the comments. We'll catch you next time.